huge audience, Roger. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Roger, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm delighted that the, uh, the graveyard slot after lunch actually generated uh, a, a, a turnout uh, more respectable, I think, than we saw in the entire electorate for the police and crime uh, commissioners uh, the other day. Fantastic effort, folks. Uh, it's been an amazing year for London. We had the Jubilee, in which the world saw a million people lining the banks of the Thames, demonstrating their loyalty, affection for the Queen and the robustness of this country's constitutional settlement. Then the Olympics, which no one thought we could pull off, uh, least of all the media, and yet I think it'd be fair to say that we did. Okay, didn't we? More or less, the, tu the, tu the tube ran okay, uh, contrary to predictions, and the G4S guys turned up from whatever it was they were doing as short order chefs in Mexico or <laughs> Cornish lobster trawlers, and, uh, and we got every single uh, athlete and every single Olympic bureaucrat and every single journalist, every single dignitary from overseas uh, to the venues, to their hotels on time. And the only piece of transport infrastructure to malfunction was a zip wire uh, in <laughs> Victoria Park. It was otherwise, it was otherwise a staggering, it was a staggering success. And we need now to build on that success. And the, the lesson of the Olympics is that we must never underestimate our strengths in this city or indeed this country. We are still the sixth biggest exporter in the world, the third biggest global exporter of services after the US and Germany. London is still the world center of banking and finance. And even if the CBR, CEBR is right to say that the sector is likely to shrink from its current high of about 320,000. The same economic think tank has also pointed to the phenomenal growth we are seeing in sectors that scarcely existed 10 years ago. London leads Europe in nanotechnology, in biotech, in academic health science with a growing constellation of intellectual power along the Euston Road. I could take you to Shoreditch and introduce you to brilliant young men and women in funny shaped glasses who can do the Times super fiendish Sudoku uh, crossword in four minutes flat and who are coming up with apps that will allow children in Ohio to watch videos on their PlayStations and that, which is good for London in some way that uh, they explained to me, uh, and, and that, that sector that sector in which we now lead virtually every other city in the world, with the possible exception of, uh, of New York, uh, has come from almost nowhere to account for 40,000 jobs. Uh, we still dominate in property, in insurance, in accountancy, and an incredible 47% of the world's legal services exports come from the UK, would you believe? 47, most of them, of course, from London. Now, I would never encourage anybody to sue, with the possible exception of Alison McAlpine. Uh, but if one, if one oligarch feels defamed by another oligarch, it is London's lawyers who apply the necessary balm to the ego. And <laughs> it, is, it is those ruble-fueled refreshers and retainers that find their way into the pockets of chefs and waiters and doormen and janitors and nannies and tutors and actors and aromatherapists and keep the wheels of the London economy turning and put bread on the tables of some of the poorest and hardest working families in this city. So I have no shame whatever in saying to the injured spouses of the world's billionaires, if you want to take him to the cleaners, darling, take him to the cleaners in London. <laughs> because the London cleaners will be grateful for your business. <laughs> and, and with more more Michelin, more Michelin starred restaurants than Paris. Yes. A fact too good to check, I feel. Uh, more, more bookshops. More bookshops, more, twice as many bookshops as New York. The lowest, the lowest murder rate in this city now, in spite of the massive increase in population for 40 years. London this year is officially the most popular city on Earth, with 16.9 million people visiting. And it's also actually the most populous, populous uh, city in Europe, as 
uh, London's, uh, there's a, a fantastic phylogenitive effort going on by the, the, the population. London's mothers are producing more babies than ever. And we are about to, uh, we are going to beat New York. We're going to hit 9 million before uh, New York. So after decades of post-war decay and depopulation, the demographic and cultural resurgence of London continues. And it is the chief glory, I would say, in great respect to everybody else who's spoken uh, today, it is the chief glory of the UK economy. And we need to proclaim that resurgence and to protect it, because we are locked in an intensifying competition with other great cities around the world. 19th century, London became the biggest and richest city on earth. Why? Because it was open, because it had doctrines of free trade and openness to trade uh, and talent. And I'm worried that we are at risk of losing some of that openness in what has been a very difficult time for the economy. We've moved from the age of excess under labor through this age of austerity, which I think should uh, come to an end, because if this country is to grow, we need to move to a new age of enterprise. And for enterprise to flourish, people like me need to be responsive to what is happening in the rest of the world. And we can't solve the banking crisis by imposing more regulations than our rivals in other European or indeed Asian jurisdictions. We shouldn't be gold-plating the rules on capital adequacy out of some guilt for having got it wrong last time if the result is it makes London less attractive as a place to establish or to expand your business. And not only have we got to stop vilifying bankers, we need to make the moral case for banking, for financing ventures at risk, for the free market allocation of capital as the most efficient means of enriching the greatest number of people. Because the human race has tried communism, and it wasn't a howling success. And symmetrically, uh, we, need more moral, uh, we need more moral leadership from the bankers. And it's not good enough, I'm afraid, for them to uh, lick their wounds behind the stuccoed walls of their Notting Hill schlosses. Uh, and uh, I, I, as that happens, I think they're, they're doing much better than they used to, and the climate is changing. And many leading financiers uh, are, are now giving and engaging with society in a way that I don't think would have happened uh, 20 or even 10 years ago. But they won't give and they won't engage if they feel persecuted and, and despised and regularly bashed by every politician under the sun. And indeed, there is a risk that they will take their business away. And so we won't succeed as a society and a city if we actively set out to sabotage a sector in which we are very strong. And therefore, we need to be careful that taxation is reasonable. And this year, yet again, Andy Murray reached the last 16 at Wimbledon. Indeed, fantastic. Along with players from Germany, France, America, Russia, Spain, Argentina, Croatia, Uzbe uh, Switzerland, Uzbekistan, and Serbia. Now, of all those tennis players, who do you think faced the biggest single confiscation of, uh, of the prize money? From his, from his national tax jurisdiction. Who was it? It was, it was, before, it was before Francois Hollande got in, by the way. <laughs> it was Andy Murray. It was, it was Andy Murray. And uh, the British top rate of tax is effectively higher now than any of our competitor countries. And it is worth bearing in mind. I mean, I merely put it to you that uh, Roger Federer was facing a tax rate of, tw of, uh, of 20%. I don't know whether it made all the difference to Andy Murray as he, as he leapt uh, for, for, whether he would have gone half a yard further and faster uh, if he'd, if he'd, if he'd uh, been, had that extra incentive. And I'm not suggesting, frankly, that it would. But <laughs> in the end, in the end, uh, at the margin and across the board, I do believe that high rates of personal taxation, uh, consistently higher rates of personal taxation, are likely to make us less competitive. And in case your heartstrings remain untwanged by the fortunes of a superstar tennis player, I should point out that the OECD now officially rates Britain as a high-tax country, with average earners, no, average earners now paying more than Sweden. We should have taxes that
that are low but fair. And it is absurd to be suddenly whacking up taxes on cash poor people who happen to inhabit expensive houses in London when firms like Google are, pay are paying zero. Now, neither arrangement strikes me as being very fair. So Google and, and co have a very clear choice. They can either change their tax arrangements or they can do much more visibly to serve the society in which they're making these profits by taking on more of the 54,000 18 to 24 year olds who are currently out of work. And that I passionately believe is the best solution for a city that had riots after all only a little more than a year ago. We need to boost apprenticeships and get young people into jobs. And I look around this room, I know there are many, many businesses here who are doing a fantastic job of taking on young people and helping us to reach our goal of 250,000 by 2016. Let's tackle youth unemployment by investing in education, by encouraging a culture of competition and excellence in our schools, by getting people into apprenticeships, and not by slamming the door on all non-UK nationals. Of course, we should keep out people who are going to be a drain on the state. But we need the software experts to be able to get here in days rather than in months. And we shouldn't have London's arts barons being forced to cancel events because the prima ballerina is stuck in Minsk and unable uh, to get a visa. We have seven of the world's top 200 universities, four of the world's top 100 universities here in this city. Foreign students account for five billion cash in to the higher education economy. And it is utterly crazy that we have been losing potential Indian students to Australia and Canada and the United States. So my message is that on tax, on regulation, and on visas, we need to be careful to remove the barriers to growth. And above all, we in City Hall and in government generally must create the physical platform for enterprise. We need security of supply for energy. The shard alone, once it gets filled, uh, is expected uh, to use four times as much juice as the town of Colchester. I mean, that's electricity, not orange juice, electricity. <laughs> though I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> we, desperately, we desperately need more housing. And with the population set to rise by a million uh, to 2020, we're talking about 300,000 more homes which we need in London alone. That may seem an astonishing number to you, but we have phenomenal opportunity areas, as everybody involved in development in this city knows. Uh, in the docks, in Barking Riverside, uh, Tottenham, uh, Victoria, Nine Elms, Battersea, Croydon, and, and so on, Brent Cross. Uh, since I was elected, uh, re-elected in May uh, this year, we've released public land, made public land available for development to the value of £490 million to help kickstart schemes. But we need to go further, faster. There are 170,000 homes in London that have been consented, but that are currently frozen on the plan. We need to get those homes built now, and it's time for an aggressive strategy to expand the private rented sector to get London building as the single best way to drive jobs and growth. Because after all, one in four SMEs in this city is involved in construction. And I, believe, I hope the Chancellor, I'm sure he is thinking of this, I think it would be a good idea if the Chancellor thought of cutting stamp duty on new build homes in order to promote supply. And I hope he, he thinks about that in the autumn statement. Above all, uh, to create the opportunity for those homes, we need to uh, build the transport, the local, national, international transport links that this city will always need to give us a global edge. If we want to unlock thousands of new homes and jobs in South London, then for heaven's sake, Let's get on and do the city's number one shovel-ready project, the Northern Line Extension. Two new stations, Battersea and Nine Elms. If we want to regenerate Tottenham and Waltham Forest and that area that suffered uh, so badly last year, then let's put in four tracking 
on the West Anglia line. And while we're on that line, let's put in a high-speed link to Stansted. Because you can't hope to compete globally if your hub airport is running out of space, or indeed has already run out of space. I speak of somebody who circled uh, only, on, only on Friday morning, who circled, like all of us, over Croydon for about, uh, about 15 minutes, having come in on perfectly. We, we left Dulles Airport perfectly on time. We flew all the way across the Atlantic, attended by, blown faster and faster by, by warm Atlantic zephyrs. Uh, we, got over, we got over London, uh, and we had to spend 15 minutes circling over Croydon. As uh, we're a perfectly beautiful place, of course. Uh, but a wonderful <laughs> thing to do. Uh, but, you know, it is, uh, as, as, the captain, as the captain told me, every 24 hours, uh, every 24 hours, planes circling over London uh, use 300,000 pounds worth of unnecessary aviation fuel, enough to send a, a flight to, uh, from, from New York to China. Uh, I congratulate, by the way, the, the CBI, John uh, Crinland, on the campaign that you have been running uh, to get more aviation capacity. I think it's an argument uh, that uh, you are winning, and I think it's very, very important. But I must warn you, that the Heathrow option is a sham, a snare, and a delusion. It will be no quicker to deliver a third runway, a short third runway at Sipson, than to deliver a, a, a 24-hour hub elsewhere. And by the time you've been through the legal challenges and the political, uh, the toxic political uh, chaos, and by the time this short runway has been completed in 2026 or 2028, to the detriment, by the way, of millions of Londoners who will wake up feeling as though somebody is using a hairdryer uh, next, to their, uh, next to their ear. Uh, that runway, that space will be overwhelmed with planes, and then the Heathrow lobby will be clamoring, as they already are, for a fourth runway with truly disastrous environmental consequences, slap bang in the middle of London's western suburbs. And instead of making that planning error, a catastrophic planning error. We now have a historic chance to do the right thing, to seize the nettle where previous generations have failed, and to go for one of three excellent options that have been identified by TfL, options for a new four-runway hub that will allow British business to think and act way beyond the miseries of the Eurozone. Only this solution will allow us to reclaim those routes to Asia, to the growth cities of Latin America that are now being colonized by our continental rivals and air airports on the continent. And that option will allow London to reassert its lead, not just as the commercial, financial, and cultural capital of Europe, but as the world capital of the BRICS. And if you look at the options in the estuary, you can see the potential for hundreds of thousands of new jobs in Southeast, London, Southeast England, one of the most productive parts of the whole EU. I believe that the lesson of the Olympics is that we should be brave and that we should go for it. Because if those games, if that effort taught us anything, is that we, it is that we have extraordinary abilities in construction and engineering. And when we plan, and when the private and the public sector work together, and we build a political consensus, then there is no limit to what we can achieve. And above all, if we did this, we would be, we would be being positive and ambitious about our future, which is what, frankly, we need to be at the moment. We need to abandon uh, the rhetoric of austerity. Because if you endlessly tell people uh, to eat nut cutlets and tighten their belts and wear a hair shirt and all, all the rest of it, uh, that is not, in my view, a, a recipe for economic confidence. Uh, you are putting a downer on growth and enterprise at a time when global opportunities are growing and not shrinking. The world economic pie was worth $32 trillion in 2000. By the time of the crash in 08, it had doubled to $62 trillion. But in spite of everything that's gone on, it is still growing fast, now at $72 trillion. In the immortal words of G.W. Bush, we are making the pie higher. And <laughs> we are. That, and London firms, globally, collectively, we are making the pie higher, $72 trillion. It'll be $82 trillion at uh, this rate in, in, in just a few years' time. London firms should be superbly placed to claim their slice of that ever-escalating uh, pie crust. 
uh, we have the right time zone, we have the right language. Uh, we have 300 of the right languages. Uh, it is a great, great city to live in, I hope you agree. We're going through a neo-Victorian phase of investment in public transport. Crossrail, as you'll have seen, is making fantastic progress. We're drawing up a 2020 vision for all the improvements we need to, uh, to make, including uh, Crossrail 2. We already have the cleanest, greenest new bus in the world. We have a steadily falling crime rate, 12 points down uh, on, on where it was uh, four years ago, uh, to pick a period entirely at random. Uh, we have the streets <laughs> pullulating, the streets pullulating with beautiful blue, furly, uh, banker-funded bicycles. And you only have to think of that Olympic opening ceremony to see our lead uh, not beijing into a cocked hat, didn't it? Uh, see our lead in the creative and culture sectors. And it is to help tell that incredible story about London that this week I'm leading a, a business mission to uh, India with banking, uh, law, retail, infrastructure, all represented uh, on the mission at, by the way, 3% of the cost to the public purse of the mission to India led in 2000, 2007 by my predecessor, um, Mr. Livingston. I just thought I'd make that point. Uh, <laughs> And I'm doing it, I'm leading that mission, because you should never underestimate this city's protean ability to find new markets around the world. We export, as I never tire of telling you, members of the CBI, uh, you export bicycles to Holland, mosquito repellent, definitely a CBI member who does this, mosquito repellent to Brazil, TV antennas to Korea, tea to China, rice to India, Piers Morgan uh, to America, <laughs> and not just, not just cake to France, as I think I may have told you, but not just cake, but I discovered the other day, we sell lavender perfume and lavender oil and essence of lavender from grown from South London lavender to France. <laughs> Parfum de Bromley, Ode, 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 Ode Wallington. And frankly, if we can sell that, my friends, we can sell anything, can't we? <laughs> and that is the achievement, that is the achievement, and that is the result of the imagination of British business. Ever since London was founded uh, in 48 AD by a bunch of pushy, pushy, Italian immigrants. <laughs> London has benefited from the consciousness that we are a great global city and we will win if we think global and open ourselves to the world. Thank you very much indeed.